could have been born at any time in history, and the Most High Yahuwah chose for us to be here and now, a time when knowledge has increased and many go to and fro. We find ourselves in the time of the end according to the book of Daniel, and as we have seen, comes with both blessings and spiritual trials like no other. The book of Revelation, the field manual to the end times, tells us what to expect and how to prepare. What was obscured from the generations with parables and hidden understandings just waiting for these last days to be unsealed. While we may also not get everything right, we will be leaning on the spirit of truth of the Most High, Yahuwah Sebaoth, in the name of Yahusha HaMashiach, to reveal to us the proper understanding. For who knows if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Revelation line by line study. This is part three. So I welcome you back. Uh, for those of you that may be new or if you're just watching this as a recording and you haven't seen part one and two, I recommend it because what we're doing is going through the book of Revelation line by line and uh, just studying it out as a Berean would. So uh, this is, uh, again, this may be one of the most important line-by-line -line studies we have done on Parable of the Vineyard. The book of Revelation has truly been veiled over the centuries, and I do believe Yahuwah has begun to unseal it over the last few years. Now, with that being said, let it be known that I am merely a student of the Word and have felt led to share the little bit of wisdom Yahuwah may have bestowed upon me, which means I won't have everything right through this study, and I ask you to test everything I say. This study will be so in-depth that even the new believer will be able to understand it. Likewise, the learned disciple will also be able to glean new information. Some concepts shared during this study may give you confirmations as to understandings you may already have, and some may be new to you. Either way, take all matters to Yahweh in prayer, and He will guide you, as it must be known that 1 John 2.27 states, the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. And Matthew twenty eight twenty three eight, But be you not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Mashiach, and you are all brethren. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, just consider me your brother and your study partner, and let's dig in. So again, what we're going to be doing is uh, reading line by line and breaking down each verse. So where we stopped last week was at the church of Ephesus. And tonight we'll be getting right back into the seven churches or the seven ecclesia as it's uh, better, uh, better stated. And we're starting off at Smyrna. So we're going to pray and we're going to blow some shofar before we get started. So let's pray and then we'll do shofar. <clears throat> Let's petition Yahuwah. Let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we just come before you in Yahusha's name, and we just praise you and thank you for your word, our King of Kings. Thank you first and foremost for sending him, and by his stripes we are healed. By his offering, we, uh, we have been made reconciled back unto you, and so we're just so joyful and thankful for that first and foremost because we know that we cannot earn our salvation. Uh, but we also thank you, just as importantly, we thank you for opening our eyes back up to your Torah, which is your word, which is Messiah. And we just pray that uh, you continue to refine each and every one of us individually as we all have our own challenges to face, that we may walk in your Torah and neither go to the left hand or to the right, but on the straight and narrow path. And let us walk as Messiah, who shall walk our perfect example. 
We bless you and thank you, especially for this Shabbat, which, as we know, as per the Scripture says, is a sign between you and us that you know who is yours. So we praise you uh, for even having a desire to um, to abide in your Shabbat, a day to eat, to eat and to drink and to bless you who have created all things. In Yahusha's mighty name, amen, amen. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Shabbat is so important. It is so important. And for those of you that will be sticking around with me afterwards for the Torah portion, or for those of you that are watching this as a recording, uh, please check out the Torah portion after this week 21. Uh, such an emphasis on the Shabbat tonight with that study. And again, as as we just mentioned that prayer, it's, uh, it's, it's his mark, brothers and sisters. His commands in general is his mark. But truly, it's the Shabbat. That is uh, what's being missed by many of uh, those that call upon his name, those that believe in him. Because most people uh, will agree that, you know, they are not to have other gods, that uh, we're not to make graven images and bow down to them, we're not to take his name in vain, um, that uh, we're supposed to honor our mother and father, that we're not supposed to murder, uh, not supposed to commit adultery, not supposed to steal, not supposed to have, uh, you know, to lie or, or uh, bear false witness, we're not supposed to covet each other's things. Those are all easy. It's the Shabbat that seems to be hidden and veiled from the majority out there. So uh, stand for the Shabbat. And, uh, it, you know, if you're listening to this as a recording and you can't uh, quite get Shabbat off yet from work or whatever is hindering you from it, maybe you have an unbelieving spouse that uh, despises you because you want to keep the Shabbat uh, set apart unto him, listen, just keep it, to, take it to prayer. And uh, we know that Yahuwah is a, an evaluator of the intents of the heart. So uh, I know that we serve a creator that is big enough and strong enough and mighty enough to change any situation. You're just going to just go, boop, 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 peace here, peace there. Poof, your prayers are answered. So, um, anyways, just keep that in prayer if that's something you're not able to do uh, just yet. So, anyways, let's uh, move on because we've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. And I am super excited, but I'm always excited. So, nothing new. All right. Revelation 2.8. And remember, listen... Remember, we read earlier in part one that we are blessed just by reading and listening the words of this prophecy, this whole book of prophecy, and to keep those things which are written herein. So, for the time is at hand is actually what it says. So, all right, we're going to be reading out of the Sefer version, uh, which is our preferred scriptures here on Parable of the Vineyard. And uh, speaking, uh, for those of you that join me in this kind of the the pre the pre uh, uh, meeting, uh, I, I went on live a few minutes early, and uh, we're talking about prepping a little bit. Listen, have some scriptures, get some scriptures in hand if you don't have, have them, because you know the internet's a great tool, but what if it just poof, poof gone like that? Uh, then all these resources are gone. So I would get a sefer because it's got all those removed books that we love uh, reading from. Also, you can go to dollar. Dollar Tree, not general, not family dollar, but Dollar Tree. They sell these complete Old and New Testament Bibles for one dollar. Best thing you can buy for a dollar these days. That was would be nice to have on hand, right? If uh, uh, things do go down, you can maybe share the, the the gospel, the good news with your neighbors. But let's uh, let's call let's uh, let's blow our our weapon here. We know that the word of Yahuwah is our weapon, but we know that this is also a, a mighty weapon in the scriptures. And I'm going to be blowing this in anticipation for the shofar blast that we're really waiting for, uh, which will be the the gathering. Praise be to Yahuwah. Let's go. Let's let's do this. Okay, give me just a second here. Okay, good to go. Revelation two eight, the church of Smyrna, the Ecclesia of Smyrna, 
And unto the angel of the called out assembly in Smyrna write, These things say is the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And just to remind you, um, we, if you hopefully you've seen part one and two, we went over the seven ecclesia, their, their name and meanings. And Smyrna means bitterness, uh, suffering, and death. Uh, Smyrna is actually just means myrrh, uh, you know, like frankincense and myrrh, part of the holy anointing oil, part of the uh, incense, uh, you know. But um, the actual meaning for myrrh is just really kind of bitterness. But I wanted to share where we also get the understanding of suffering and death. I want to read for you from the first book of Adam and Eve, chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. Now, if you're not familiar with this book, we've got a line-by-line study of this. Uh, You know, this is another one of those books that uh, man will tell you not to read. He'll say, oh, that's not inspired. Oh, it's just, you know, it's a fake writing, whatnot. Test it Test it with the Spirit of the Most High, and let the Spirit of the Most High do the teaching for you and tell you if this book is, is uh, inspired or not. So this is chapter 31. Uh, After these things, Elohim said unto Adam, Thou didst ask me something from the garden to be comforted therewith. This is when after they were kicked out of the garden and they were just mourning the whole time because they missed being in the garden. Thou didst ask of me something from the garden to be comforted therewith, and I have given thee these three tokens as a consolation to thee, that thou trust in me and in my covenant with thee. For I will come and save thee, and kings shall bring me when in the flesh gold, incense, and myrrh. So this is obviously Messiah, Yahusha, speaking to Adam. We know that all things were created through the word, through Messiah, Yahusha. So um, so that he's saying that this is when he's going to come and be born, and we know the, the three kings or wise men or uh, magi, whatever you want to call them, when they brought him the uh, gold, incense, and myrrh. So again, for I will come and save thee, and kings shall bring me, when in the flesh, gold, incense, and myrrh. Now listen, gold as a token of my kingdom, incense as a token of my divinity, that's the frankincense, and myrrh as a token of my suffering and of my death. So this is where I got the understanding of the true definition of what myrrh stands for. So, <clears throat> and, you know, we just read, And to the angel of the church of the called out assembly in Smyrna write, These things say at the first and last, which was dead and is alive. And again, uh, Smyrna being bitterness and or suffering and death, this is, uh, you know, a symbol of Messiah Yahusha being dead, but now is alive forevermore. So hallelujah to that. Verse 9, I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Yahudim, Jews, and are not, but are are the synagogue of Satan. This is a big one. We're going to be talking a little bit about this here in a second. But backing up, before we get there, so this is another church. As we talked about in Ephesus, they had great qualities. He's like, I know that you hate evil people, um, the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans uh, and so on and so forth. So this, this church as well, um, Smyrna, they have good qualities too. They have works. Uh, they, they're enduring tribulation. Uh, they're in poverty, right? Um, but he's like, but you're rich. And you don't even know it. And I know the blasphemy then. So actually, we'll go in that part here in a second. But so let, let's let's focus on this. So the you know they have good qualities, and and if you haven't caught the first two parts, or at least last week, you know I do believe that all seven of these ecclesia are alive right now, and I think this is just just uh, describing seven different you know groups of people based off of their their belief or unbelief, uh, their actions, their deeds, um, their obedience or non obedience. And I think what Yahuwah is doing here is classifying people into seven different groups based off of what they do or what they believe. So, again, this group has works, tribulation, and they're in poverty. So let's talk about this a little bit about the tribulation, um, you know, works in poverty. So uh, it says uh, it says that they're rich, right? Well, let's talk about why they're rich. Matthew six nineteen through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither wrath nor Moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we should be focused on the heavenly things. We should be focused on, you know, uh, our, our 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 salvation, our our works, our belief, our, our obedience. 
which is what he's always wanted from us. Don't let anybody uh, lead you astray with with vain, you know, vain deceit that the keeping of the commandments is not important, that it's just belief and you just go on and, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody fool you with that. And I know those of you that are listening here, you probably, you're not first time listeners and you're not just stumbling across this and you've been called, you've been called to faith in Messiah, Yahushua, with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you've been called to keep the commandments with all of your heart, soul, and mind, right? Isaiah 33, 6, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation, the fear of Yahuwah, is his treasure. So that's his treasure, right? We were just talking about our treasure is, you know, storing up basically good, good works. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Even in Ephesians uh, Ephesians 2, uh, where it says, you know, salvation is a free gift from Elohim, not of works, lest any man boast. But then it goes on to say, because we are created for good works, right? So it's like Messiah Yahusha saved us, so let's do good works because he saved us. It's like a renewed understanding, a renewed way to keep the Torah. Hallelujah. But the fear of Yahuwah, so fearing him, that's his treasure. Right? The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of Yahuwah is not is the beginning of knowledge. It's what he deserves from us. Let's talk about poverty a little bit. First Samuel two eight. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth uh, lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes, and to make them in- inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Yahuwah's, and He hath set the world on them. Whew, a lot there, right? We know, we know, Yahuwah can take somebody in literal poverty and raise them into riches, just like that, if He wanted to. But we'll talk a little more about spiritual poverty here in a second. But then, of course, since we're here, since we're here, the pillars of the earth are Yahuwah's, right? And he hath set the world upon them. He is not describing a a, a globe, a ball, hurling through infinite space at 66,000 miles an hour, twisting at 1,000 miles an hour on a 23.4 axis. <laughs> he said he's talking about something that is set on a foundation, and we know this other scripture says, because so it can never be moved. But moving on. James 2, 1 through 5. My brethren, have not the faith of our Adonai, Yahusha HaMashiach, the Adonai of glory with respect of persons? For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Ha- now, this is this is actually why I'm reading this scripture right here. I just I was kind of setting it up for here. This is it right here. This is where James captures it. Hath not Elohim chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him? This is this really this, now. This doesn't ring. This probably doesn't ring a bell for a lot of us. Maybe not everybody. For me personally, it did. It did. It did. Uh, part of my testimony is before I came back to him, um, you know, I was very, I had a very successful sales career. Um, I made a lot of money. Uh, I made six figures almost every year in those 13 years in sales, uh, right? And it wasn't until I lost that job and fell on my face and lost everything um, that I was finally ready to listen to him. So in my literal poverty is when I was re- finally n- ready to not be so hard-hearted and to listen and and humble myself and repent and turn my turn myself around he he did it right the the ruach did the work and did the ruach the, the ruach did the work in all of us but this rings true to me because it wasn't until I was made poor that I was finally ready to listen and I'm sure that you a lot of you can relate some of you're like don't know what you're talking about that's okay. <laughs> but still, the point being is Elohim has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. Now, we've got to read the, the Beatitudes. We just have to. Matthew 5, uh, 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? So this is this really reminds me of what is, the, is capturing what's going on here. I know your works tribulation and poverty, but you are rich 
And I think this is really kind of capturing what we're talking about here. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And this is actually a really big one too. Blessed are they that mourn. Uh, it reminds me of in Ezekiel 9, when you've got the uh, the the writer with the inkhorn dressed in white. And he was told to set a mark upon those that sighed and mourned for all the abominations committed in Jerusalem, right? So it's like they were sighing because of people, you know, going astray, people breaking the commandments, people uh, disregarding the Torah, uh, buying and selling on Shabbat, uh, disregarding the Moadim, the feast days, uh, people, you know, sacrificing unto strange gods, uh, burning incense to other gods, whatever. They were mourning for all the abominations done in, in Jerusalem. And they were given the mark of protection and everyone else was killed. In Zephaniah 3, it says, I will gather them that are sorrowful uh, sorrowful for the solemn assembly and that he will gather those people. So this is important. We should mourn for the apostasy that's going, the rampant apostasy that's going on in this world, the rampant apostasy for probably the, I mean, 95% of those that claim to be followers of Messiah, I think we should mourn for that. I think we should mourn for our brothers and sisters and, and our family members that are still celebrating these pagan holidays. Should we not? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We should mourn about the filth that's going on in this world. We should mourn about the millions of abortions, which is the... It, which is the child sacrifice with a new face on it. This is, you know, the, the children passing through the fire to Molech back in the days of the ancient Israelites happening right now. We should mourn for this stuff, right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And truly, this is something that is so under-embraced in this walk, especially in, even in this movement, because Yahuwah has given us some, a little bit of wisdom woken us up unto Messiah Yahushua, brought, him, brought us back into him, teaching us the Torah. And here we are swinging the sword around at each other, wanting to, acting like we're, like we're each other's enemy because we're white or we're black or because we are on the Zadok calendar or on the lunar calendar or on this calendar or we're sun, sunrise to sunrise or sunset to sunset. Like, where's the meekness? Where's the humility? Where's the humbleness? Have we all become that... Have we all become that servant that was forgiven all that debt by the king? And as soon as we are forgiven that debt, we go out and smite our fellow brother and say, pay me what you owe or I'll throw you into jail. I know that's a little bit different, but seriously, think of all that we've been forgiven and we're going to go tear each other apart like we're each other's enemy. Really? Sure, we can sharpen each other. Sure, we can have some excellent back and forth conversation, but I've seen some wickedness, you know, even in this movement because we're given a little wisdom. And now it's gotten to our head. So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And boy, are we being filled in these last days. Hallelujah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Again, Yahuwah Abba has been so merciful to us. How many of us lived a terrible life? Uh, there's a few of you out there. I know there's a few of you out there like Adam. Uh-uh. I've been I've been good for my youth up. Amen. Hallelujah. But for a lot of us, without his mercy, where would we be right now? We need to be merciful with each other. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim. And this is why I put that controversial this is why Justin and I put that controversial video out a couple days ago. Listen, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to um believe what we believe as far as who is who but the wickedness in people's heart for hating one another because of skin color and you know whatever come on that's not pure in heart you're not going to see elohim blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of elohim blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Blessed are ye when men shall revive. And this is actually big too. Uh, and I know that persecution, the, the persecution that some of us are going through is, is nothing like the early church uh, with, you know, families, entire families with their babies being thrown into the, the, the Roman, um, you know, 
um, arenas and being torn apart by lions and people being nailed to a cross and being uh, doused with uh, you know with kerosene and lit lit on fire uh, to light uh, Nero's um, you know garden and of course Messiah Yahushua what how he was persecuted um, you know Peter. Peter um, being crucified upside down, Paul losing his head, John the Baptist losing his head. So, so listen, the kind of per- the persecution that some of us are facing, it's minuscule compared to that. But listen, for some of us, we have zero peace in our own home just because we want to follow Torah. We want to keep Shabbat. I know a brother named David Weems. Pray for him. He lost his family. His wife is divorcing him and filed a restraining order against him, uh, against his ch- uh, you know children, so he can't see his children. You know that. Listen, brother and sister, that's persecution. It is. There's, you know, there's believers. You know, in China. I mean, China's got you know all kinds of problems now. But there's you know believers in China. They can't even they can't even meet together. They they got to go in underground uh, places to to meet. There's people being killed for for believing in Messiah these days. So it's all over the place. It's just different types. But nevertheless, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Amen. Okay, back on track. So let's uh let's get to the other half here so it says and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are yahudim jews and are not but are the synagogue of satan who is the synagogue of satan let's read a little bit of a few passages here uh yehonan john 8 38 through 44 i speak that which i have seen with my father this is messiah speaking to the pharisees they're going back and forth here and ye do that which ye have seen with your father right he's like i've got my father you've got your father they answered and said unto him abraham is our father Yahushua saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of Elohim. And we know what the truth is, right? The truth is the Torah, which I have heard of Elohim. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We be born not a fornication. We have one father, even Elohim. Yahushua saith unto him, If Elohim were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from Elohim. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Right? We know the Messiah, Yahushua, was the walking word. He was the walking Torah. They didn't love his, they didn't love his Torah. They were going through the motions. They loved their own man-made traditions, the washing of the pots and, you know, um, their own commandments, their own extra laws on the Sabbath and all this kind of stuff. They love that stuff. They love the greetings in the marketplaces. They love they love to devour widows' houses. They are pretenders. They didn't love his Torah. Why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? What's his word? It's the law, the prophets, the writings. They didn't love it. You so he's now he's saying to them, you Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. This is the this is those Jews, those unbelieving Jews. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Acts seven forty three. This is Stephen's famous speech before he got stoned, right? And he's he's talking to the Jews like right in their face. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch. This is Baal, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them. And I'll carry you away beyond Babylon. What is the star of Remphan? Let's take a look here. I thought I had some images up here. Yeah. Okay, I do. What is that star of Remphan? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It is not the star of David. This is the star of Remphan. Look at it. Look at it on the Pope's head here. Look at that. The same mystery Babylon that started in Jerusalem, going astray from the Most High, serving other nations. She is the original harlot going astray from Yahuwah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yep. This is who they serve. 
They still serve him today. So once again, who are the Jews that say they are Jews and are not, but do lie? They don't serve Yahuwah. They have forsaken. They have forsaken the, the fountain of living water. First John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, for this purpose, the son of Elohim was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But let's go back to the synagogue of Satan. Let's read some of their, what they believe. This is the Talmud. And I want you to know up front, I hate the Talmud. I think it's disgusting. I am reading this for you, not for doctrine, but to expose who the synagogue of Satan are. This is Gitin 57a. Onkelos then went, Onkelos, this is one of their sages. Onkelos then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene. Another version says Yeshu or Yeshua. Onkelos then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy, right? We know this is against the Torah, so they don't love the Torah. They love their own writings. Onkelos said unto him, Who is the most important in that world where you are now? So he's speaking to, apparently he's speaking to Jesus down in, down in Sheol, right? Jesus said to him, the Jewish people. Onkelos asked him, should I then attach myself to them in this world? Jesus said to him, their welfare you shall seek, their misfortune you shall not seek. For anyone who touches them is regarded as if he were touching the apple of his eye. And we're going to continue here. Onkelos said to him, what is the punishment of that man? A euphemism for Jesus himself, right? He's like, what's your punishment in the next world? Jesus said to him, he is punished with boiling excrement. Excrement is number two. It's poop. So <clears throat> apparently by this writing, Onkelos is talking to Jesus, Jesus, and uh, Jesus is saying that he is now living in hell in boiling and poop. As the master said, anyone who mocks the words of the sages will be sentenced to boiling excrement, boiling poop. And this was his sin. Yeah, and this was his sin as he mocked the words of the sages. So even in the Talmud, this is verifying the uh, the 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 works of Yah- of Yahusha, our Messiah, that he mocked the sages, right, uh, and he defied them. He defied their man-made laws. <laughs> they they're saying he existed, right? The Jamara comments: Come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. As Balaam, who was a prophet, wished Israel harm, whereas Jesus the Nazarene, who was a Jewish sinner. Jewish sinner sought their well-being. And that's what people get confused in church is they think that Messiah broke the Sabbath, like Yahweh's Sabbath. No, he broke the Jews' Sabbath. He broke these Talmudic Sabbath rules, the extra rules that says you can't even lift your hand, put your hand outside of it. If a, it, the, the Talmud says this is all this extra garbage, this is why Messiah Yahushua did stuff on the Sabbath specifically. On It's why he did healings on the Sabbath. He did it just to show them to show them that their writings were wickedness. But they wouldn't hear because they love their own stuff. They didn't love the Torah. So they have a law that says if a man, poor man, a beggar comes up to your door and is starving and just needs some food and you reach your hand out and give him some food, you have broken the Jews' Sabbath. Right? So this is the synagogue of Satan, my brothers and sisters. And yes, they are back in Mystery Babylon... That can be a whole nother, uh, whole nother rabbit trail, but we will definitely be going deep into Mystery Babylon when we get there. Don't worry. Okay, so, you know, and here, just one last passage. We saw that Messiah just rebuked these people. Mark 7, 1 through 13, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. Because there's no uh, there's no law in the Torah that says you've got to wash your hands before you eat. But they added these laws that says, you know, you are defiling yourself and you're you're, def- you're defiling yourself and you're breaking uh, breaking the law by, you know, not, uh, you know, not washing your hands before you eat. So they found fault in his, in Messiah, uh, Messiah's disciples for 
for not washing their hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders, not the, tra- not the tradition of the Torah. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold. As So there's many other traditions they have, right? Uh, here's another example as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. And in another uh, in another passage, Messiah rebuked them for being like whitewashed tombs because on the outside they're all shiny and polished, right? Style, but on the inside they're full of death. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And how scary this is for modern day apostasy. You have a couple billion that are living right now that profess Messiah Husha, but they could care less about his commandments. They can care less about the Torah. So, once again, you've got a three what three billion people? How many two billion people honoring them, him with their lips, but their heart is far from him? And he says it here: How be in vain they do worship me? Is there billions of people worshiping him in vain right now? Maybe teaching for doctrine of the commandments of men. Well, what does doctrines of men say right now? The Torah is done away with. It's put aside. The Sabbath, you know, Yeshua is our Sabbath, or they say Jesus is our Sabbath, right? Yet, <laughs> that very same chapter that they pull from says there remains a Sabbath rest for the children of, of, uh, of Elohim. In any case. So, we know Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 1 9 says, There's nothing new to the sun. History is going to repeat itself. What's been will be happen again, happening again. For laying aside the commandment of Elohim, which is currently done right now by the majority of people, but praise be to Yahuwah, he's waking up a remnant, calling them back to obedience to his ways. That is the refreshing wherewith we shall be refreshed, brothers and sisters. Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing pots and cups and many other things, such things like ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of Elohim, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corbin, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. So basically, they... Um, the Torah states that you're supposed to take care of your parents, right, in their old age. Um, but in me- their traditions, they basically said, it, basically what it was is they could give that help to the temple and they would be loosed from that burden of taking care of their parents, right? So making of no effect the commandments. So, and ye suffer him not, I'm sorry, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of Elohim of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered and many such things like you do. And again, brothers and sisters, the same things are happening today. The same things. Alright. Verse 10. 2.10 Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So, remember, this church is Smyrna, and the name of it was bitterness, or suffering and death. I don't see where where these people are wrong. I don't see uh, what they've done wrong. So, you know, some are destined for suffering when this comes, even though it seems that there is nothing to rebuke this group with, or maybe we just don't see it all here. But think about Elisha. Think about Elisha. What did Elisha do wrong? I can't find anything in the scriptures where Elisha did anything wrong. And he suffered from a disease and withered away and died. It's just how it goes sometimes. We have to trust Yahuwah knows what's best in every situation. What about John the Baptist? Was he at fault? I don't know if I find no fault in him. He got his head cut off. Peter? Well, you know, Peter did deny a Messiah. You know, but I mean, again, what are we talking about here? He got crucified upside down. Yahuwah knows best. So it says here that there are going to be some people that are destined for death. Sit into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. 
you know, it is interesting that in the same, uh, just a, a verse earlier, that the fake Yahudim, the fake Jews, are mentioned alongside this ecclesia, uh, you know, they're throwing them in jail. If these Noahide laws come into worldwide effect, many will be beheaded for idolatry, according to those laws which will be placed in effect by the corrupt Sanhedrin. Because worshiping Yahusha, the son of Elohim, is in their book considered um, idolatry, which idolatry is punishable by death. So, regardless, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Let's talk about crowns. Cause let's talk about something good. James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which Yahuwah hath promised to them that love him. So in extreme measure, tried, you know, temp this word temptation is more like trial, right? Blessed is the man that uh, endures trials. For when he's tried... He shall receive the crown of life. So in extreme, giving up your life. Being martyred, being being killed. Um, on a less, you know, uh, less severe end, but trials are trials on the left, nonetheless. You know, we all have we all have it. It's it, I it, you know, I, I could sit here for an hour and talk about all the different trials and, and tribulations that we all have individually, small, large, extremely large. I mean, everything from you know, spouses dying to children dying to um, open up the book of Job and you can see how uh, almost every way a man can be tempted or tried if you would. But it says, Blessed is the man that endureth uh, trials, temptation. For when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which Yahweh hath promised to him, to them that love him. Second Timothy 4, eight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which Yahuwah, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Whew. Who is who is loving his appearing? Who is loving the day of his appearing? I know I am. How about you? What's your hope in? Is your hope in your job, your income, your house, your cars, your children, your children's education, your education, or whatever else you could, you know, put your hope in? Or is your hope in his return? Is your hope in Messiah, Yahusha? First Peter 5, 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's get some hallelujahs up in that chat. First Corinthians nine twenty four through twenty five. Know ye not that which that they which run a race at all? Mm -mm, stop, Adam. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Now the good news is there's not only one crown, so that's the good news. But you know, we should be. So this is what Paul is saying. You know, if if you really believe that Paul you know, was a uh, was a proponent of doing away with the law, right? If there was nothing to do, no works. If we just believe and just kick back and put our feet up, drink some you know whatevers, some cocktails, uh, that's not running a race, right? That's not striving to the finish line. Verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. Amen. Second Timothy two second Timothy two five, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. And is that not the same with us? Are we not striving for a crown? And doing so lawfully, at least we should, we should be. Okay. And we can't talk about crowns and not read my favorite passage. Almost, This is probably one of my favorite passages of all time. This is 2 Esdras, chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Again, to those of you that may not know, 2 Esdras was, uh, of course, 2 Esdras was uh, included in the 1611 KJV. I, and removed in like the 1800s, part of the Apocrypha, I, Ezra, saw on Mount Zion a great multitude which I could not number, and they were all praising Yahuwah with songs. In their midst was a young man of great stature, taller than any of the others, and on the head of each of them he placed a crown. But he was more exalted than they, and I was held spellbound. Then I asked the angel, Who are these, my lord? 
He answered and said to me, These are they who have put off mortal clothing and have put on the immortal, and they have confessed the name of Elohim. Now they are being crowned and receive palms. Are you, have you, are you confessing the name of Elohim? The confessing the name of Yahuwah? Confessing his son's name, Yahusha? Then I said to the angel, Who is that young man who places crowns on them and puts palms in their hands? He answered and said to me, He is the son of Elohim, Messiah, whom they confessed in the world. So I began to praise the, those who had stood valiantly for the name of Yahuwah, valiantly for the name of Yahusha. Are you standing valiantly for his name? It's, this name is twofold. I believe it is very important to profess his name. Very important. Our words matter. They have power. They have meaning. His name wouldn't have been removed over 6,300 times by the, <laughs> by the evil ones if it wasn't important. I mean, think about it. In Judaism, they don't call upon his name. They say Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. The name, the name, the name. The name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. Christianity. Lord, 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 God, 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 Lord, Lord, Lord. They don't say his name. But for his set apart people, his called out assembly, he's waking you up, isn't he? Praise be to Yahuwah through Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay. So verse, uh, uh, let's see where we're at here. So, okay, so verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Ruach says unto the called out assemblies. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So, again, each church at the end of it, even in the ones that have parts where they're being rebuked, at the end, it's like, hey, if you get away from this stuff or if you overcome, this is what you get. And I don't know if I, if I read it last week, but I want to read um, maybe towards the end here. Actually, just real quickly. Let's read the seven promises real quickly. This is... Uh, yeah. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yahuwah. Next one. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. That's what we just read. Three. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the, in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives of it. Four, and he that overcomes and guards my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. Five, he that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the sephir, the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. 6. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of Yahuwah, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of Yahuwah, and the name of the city of Yahuwah, which is renewed Yerushalayim, which comes down out of heaven from Yahuwah, and I will write upon him my new name. Last one. 7. To him that overcomes I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Amen. Okay, let's get back to it. So, uh, so we just read, uh, he shall not be hurt of the second death. What is the second death? Let's read a few scriptures regarding the second death. Revelation 20, verse 6 say, says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of Mashiach and shall reign with him a thousand years. I mean, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are teaching that we're currently in the thousand-year millennial reign, but um, not the case, brothers and sisters. I do fully believe in a physical kingdom coming down here and a physical kingdom ruling and reigning here from New Jerusalem. I mean, Revelation 20, 12 through 14, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Elohim, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Matthew ten twenty eight and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Amen. 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 
And uh, one more passage to Ezra 12, 31 through 34. And as for the line, this is a vision that, that uh, Ezra was given. This is Ezra, the same Ezra, the, the priest we read about in the scriptures. Uh, his nickname is Ezra, or you know, it's like the Greek way of saying it. And as for the lion whom you saw rousing up out of the forest and roaring and speaking to the eagle and reproving him, the eagle, this is the fourth beast in the vision of Daniel. And this is the current beast that's reigning right now on earth. And speaking to the eagle, Rome, and reproving him for his unrighteousness. And as for all his words that you have heard, this is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days, who will arise from the posterity of David and will come and speak to them. He will denounce them for their ungodliness and for their wickedness and will cast up before them their contemptuous dealings. For first, he will set them living before his judgment seat. And when he has reproved them, then he will destroy them. So he's going to resurrect. Remember in Daniel 12, it says, uh, there's going to be a resurrection for the just and the, un- and the unjust or the um, you know what forgive me I don't want to get this wrong I should memorize this by now but I didn't and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so this is the resurrection so <clears throat> For first he will set them living before his judgment, so this is the resurrection seat. And when he has reproved them, then he will destroy them. But he will deliver them in mercy, the remnant of my people, those who have been saved throughout my borders, and he will make them joyful until the end comes, the day of judgment, which I spoke to you at, at the beginning. So this is the same thing. So those of that take place in the first, resurre- first resurrection uh, in righteousness, they will be entering into New Jerusalem, uh, and those that are without will be in uh, sorrow until that day of judgment okay and so we're done with Smyrna but I actually forgot to read just this quick little uh, write up about Smyrna Uh, I should probably zoom in a little bit here so Smyrna Myr right an ancient city of Iona on the western coast of Asia Minor about 40 miles to the north of Ephesus it is now the chief city of Anatolia, having a mixed population of about 200,000, of whom one-third are professed Christians. The, th- the church founded here was one of the seven addressed by our Adonai, Revelation 2, 8 through 11, which we just read. The celebrated Polycarp, a pupil of John, the Apostle John, was the, the second century, was in the second century, a prominent leader in the church of Smyrna. He suffered martyrdom in A.D. 155. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's just a little bit about Smyrna. Okay. So now we're going to move on to uh, we're going to move on to Pergamum. In Pergamum, we're going to read we're actually going to read Re- uh, Revelation 12, or I'm sorry, 2 12 through 17, and then we're we're going to watch a quick little video. Uh, it's going to bless you period. And to the angel of the called out assembly in Pergamos write, these things says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is, and you hold fast my name and have not denied my belief, my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my believing martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Yashrael, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So have you also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach says unto the called out assemblies. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. So, let's go back to part thir- uh, verse 13 here. Give me just a second. And... Okay, hang on. Okay. So, we I want to I want to show you a quick video that explains verse thirteen better than anywhere I found. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name and have denied my deny my belief, even in those days where an Antipas was my believing martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. So let's watch this quickly. Thanks to CBN for this. I, John, was on the island that is called Patmos, 
I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. I want to make sure you guys can hear this. Let me know if you guys can hear this really quickly. Uh, if somebody would just give me an A-OK, -okay, we can hear you. would be awesome. Just, uh, I know we got a short little delay here. Let me know if you guys could hear this in the chat, the, the video I just played. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, okay, I got a thumbs up. A okay, good. Let's do this. All right. And I heard behind me a loud voice. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Today all that's left of Pergamon are ruins, but when the Apostle John wrote his letter to the church there, it was one of the most influential cities in the Roman Empire. Pergamum had a unique status that was different than any other city because it was the political center. And it was from there that all of the rulings were made, which affected the whole of Asia Minor. The city's Acropolis rivaled Athens, and its library was the second largest in the ancient world, with a collection so great that the Roman general Mark Antony presented it as a wedding gift to Cleopatra. At the end of the first century, Pergamon was a thriving city. So why does the book of Revelation call it the dwelling place of Satan? The answer lies in the ruins of the city's temples. On one side, it was a very beautiful city. But on the flip side, it was one of the darkest, eeriest cities in the whole Roman Empire. The people of Pergamon were known as the temple keepers of Asia. The city had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor, another for the goddess Athena, and the great altar of Zeus, the king of the Greek gods. Many scholars believe this altar is the throne of Satan mentioned in the book of Revelation. That word throne was first used to describe a chair that was used in a personal private residence. And it was the chair for the Lord of the house, the master of the house. The very fact that Jesus would use that word in this verse means Satan felt at home there. He sat on a throne there. It was his territory. He was the master of that house. The city also had a healing center called the Asclepion. It was built in honor of the Greek serpent god Asclepios. In the first century, this was a cross between a hospital and a health spa, where patients could get everything from mud baths to major surgery. Even the emperors came all the way from Rome to be treated here. But this was no ordinary doctor's visit. If you were a terminal patient, then you were not allowed to go into the Asclepian. And these Asclepian priests didn't want anyone hearing somebody had died in the Asclepian. And in fact, there was a huge sign just above the official entrance to the Asclepian which said, death is not permitted here. So the only way you're going to get in to begin with is if they knew you were going to live. Patients entered through this underground tunnel. Then they drank a sedative and slept here in the dormitories while non-poisonous snakes crawled around them all night. They were told that the serpent god Asclepios would speak to them in their dreams and give them a diagnosis. It was believed that the snakes actually carried the healing power of Asclepios. And if a snake slithered across you while you were sleeping at night, that was a divine sign that healing power was coming to you. The next morning, the patients told their dreams to the priests who prescribed their treatments. Finally, the patients made clay sculptures of the body parts that needed healing and offered them to Asclepios. The people of Pergamon worshipped a myriad of Greek and Roman gods, 
But when Christianity arrived with the belief in just one God, the city's pagan priests went on the attack, and their most famous victim was a man named Antipas. In the book of Revelation, Jesus called Antipas my faithful martyr. He was the bishop of Pergamum, ordained by the apostle John. And his faith got the attention of the priests of Asclepius, who complained to the Roman governor in Pergamum. The priests testified that demons appeared to them in their dreams and told them that the prayers of Antipas were driving them out of the city. He had cast out so many devils that the demons, the spirits, had been complaining to pagans, you've got to do something about this Antipas. Antipas was ordered to offer a sacrifice of wine and incense to a statue of the Roman emperor and declare that the emperor was Lord and God. He refused. If you reject the divinity of the emperor, it's the equivalent of rejecting the city of Rome. And believers were killed for this. Antipas was sentenced to death on the altar of Zeus. Most of that altar survives today, and surrounding it are some of the world's most famous marble friezes. They portray the battle between the Greek gods and the giants. At the top of the altar was a hollow bronze bull, designed for human sacrifice. They would take the victim, place him inside the bull. They would tie him in such a way that his head would go into the head of the bull. Then light a huge fire under the bull. And as the fire heated the bronze, the person inside the bull would slowly begin to roast to death. And as the victim would begin to moan and would begin to cry out in pain, his cries would go through all of the pipes which were in the head of the bull, so it seemed to make the bull come alive. Even in the midst of the flames, Antipas died praying for his church. A few years later, the... Wow. <clears throat> we'll stop right there. Um, wow, brothers and sisters. I... Um... I just wanted to share that with you. I mean, that that is uh, that's persecution. You know, we were talking about persecution earlier. That's that's persecution. That's no wonder. No, I mean, no wonder Messiah Yahusha thought it meet to. You know, talk about Antipas as faithful martyr. I mean, can you imagine? Inside of a inside of a bronze bull, too. Wow, unbelievable, unbelievable. We know who we know who's getting a crown, the Antipas. Hmm. Oh, whoops. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. All right. So. So I uh, definitely I'm not a CBN guy, but they definitely had a great video to offer us on that subject so okay so verse 14 but i have a few things against you so this church you know has great things again so they have great works um yeah, they're holding fast to his name has did not denied his faith um but he's like here i've got some problems with you i've got a few things against you because you have them there that hold the doctrine of balaam who taught balak to cast a stumbling block for the children of israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication so let's talk a little bit about uh balaam i got a quick little uh a summary here for you so balak the king of moab was frightened by israel coming out of egypt so this is them coming after out of the um, the exodus and there's just massive people right that's taking down everywhere they go i mean they people all over the 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 that area heard about the parting of the sea they heard about uh, the devastation of egypt they heard about jericho falling down uh, the land was trembling right and so balak the king of moab was frightened by Israel coming out of Egypt. So he called for Balaam, who was a famous or known prophet at the time. He called him to curse Israel um, uh, for him, and he offered him tons of riches to entice him to do so. So Balaam uh, consulted with Yahuwah. So apparently he was a prophet of Yahuwah. So he consulted with Yahuwah, 
And Yahweh instructed him not to curse the children of Israel. He's like, you can't curse them because I've blessed them. And so Balaam at that point was innocent at that point because he's like, he told Balak, he's like, I can't do it. He's like, I can't curse. Uh, I can't do anything unless Yahweh let me. And he said no. So Balak pressed Balaam and he went on like, like I think it was seven times or maybe it was three times. I can't remember exactly. But he kept pressing Balaam to do this. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, do this. I'll give you more. And I'll give you more, 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 more. I will raise you into honor. You know, I'll, I'll. so uh, continue to ask him. And each time Balaam said he could not go against the will of Yahuwah and could not curse them. But Balaam found a way. Balaam wanted the riches for the reward. And we, we see we read about this in Second Peter who he was greedy of gain. So he realized so Balaam was smart, but he was also dumb because he went against Yahuwah. He was trying to get around the he was trying to get around Yahuwah saying he couldn't curse them. So he's like, you know what, I'm gonna come up with a plan to let Israel curse themselves. So what he did was he sent all the Moabite women. He told Balak to send out all the Moabite women and you know in in I'm sure, sure, seductive clothing and uh, to seduce the the men of Israel uh, to curse themselves by breaking the commands of Yahweh because they ended up joining unto the women. Uh, and they were they you know were sexually uh, involved with them and they ate sacrifices unto their god. Uh, I think what's their who's their god? Chemosh or uh, you know we're not even supposed to repeat the names of these other gods, but uh, they end up. Uh, uh, getting together with these women and eating their sacrifice to their, to their lowercase god, lowercase g god. And uh, so that was what Balaam did. He's like, I'm going to figure out a way. So let's just read a quick passage here from Second Peter. Second Peter 2, 1 through 16. This, this is kind of a longer thing, kind of leading up to what I want to talk about. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. It's happening now. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Adonai that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth, this is the way of truth, is the, the way of following a Torah, shall be evil spoken of. Isn't that happening right now? Boy, is that not come alive right now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Yahuwah, of course. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not? For if Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto, unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Remember earlier we read about being mournful for what's going on in this country, and actually this whole world? Mourning for the apostasy amongst those that name themselves believers? For Yahuwah knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh lust in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them before Yahuwah. But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken, are destroyed, speak evil of these things that, are, that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, which we know that Torah is the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, this is Balaam we're talking about here, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. So, remember, we talked about it last week, the doctrine of the, Nicol the Nicolaitans, which was antinomianism, lawlessness. 
is not the majority of churches, quote-unquote churches, that are supposed to be feeding the flock? Are they not teaching lawlessness? And some would say, oh, they're not. They're good people. They they love Jesus. You know, they love they love the Lord. Um, but how how do we know that we love him? It's by keeping his commandments. How do we know that we know him? It's by keeping his commandments. This, that is the love, the two commandments the Messiah talked about. Loving Yahweh with all of our heart, soul, and mind, which he quotes Deuteronomy 6, and you continue in Deuteronomy 6, we love him by keeping his commandments. Same thing, how do we love our neighbor? We love them by not committing adultery and not murdering another and not coveting their stuff and not lying to them and the many other things that we read about in Torah and the prophets and the writings of how to love our neighbor. So I ask you, are they loving Elohim and they loving their neighbor with all their heart, soul, and mind as the scriptures tell us to? No. So what's happening in Christianity today? A fruitless faith honoring Yahweh with their lips, but their heart is far from him. Sinning and not keeping his commandments one once again due to these doctrines. So do I believe that this church here, Pergamum, some of these people are alive today in churches that have good works and hold fast to his name and has not denied his belief? But do some of them have, are they committing fornication, right? By serving his other feast days, worldly first feast days, Saturnalia, Christmas, Halloween, Trunk or treat. Easter, Easter eggs, Ishtar. Fertility rites, was it a fertility, uh, fertility, um, fertility practice, an ancient fertility pagan practice, right? So verse 15, so you have them also that hold the doctrine of Nicolaites in which things I hate. So this goes right into it. Remember, their thing was lawlessness. They taught lawlessness. They taught uh, by faith alone and no works. Works didn't matter. You just do as you please. Lawlessness. Remember, Messiah in Matthew seven twenty three. Away from me. I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. You lawless person, you. I never knew you. First John 2, 3, here it is how we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and, and uh, keeps not his commandments is a liar. All right, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Brothers and sisters, we all must repent. Most of us were raised in darkness and praise to Yahuwah. He's giving us eyes to see out of obscurity and coming back to his ways. Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Truly. And if you mess up, repent. Listen, again, I'm not on some soapbox here like, oh, I'm perfect, look at me. No, no, listen, I mess up too, but we got to repent. We got to, we have to put our faults before him. That's not a license to sin and be like, oh, yeah, I know he's going to forgive me, you know, so I can just go, you know, I'll mess up. I'll, I'll look at porn just one more time, you know, I'll look at, you know, I'll, uh, I'll lust after my neighbor's wife just, just with my eyes for just a moment. I'll think about it, but I won't do anything about it. I'll hate my brother a little bit. I know Yahuwah will forgive me. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. No. But we do mess up. But listen, repent. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Get on your knees. Ask him to take that wickedness out of your heart so that you do not continue transgressing him. Verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach says unto the called out assemblies. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you, brothers and sisters. This hidden manna, right? It's like this. We know that in... Um, it was in the end of Enoch, it says that uh, his called out people would love his word more than... Love to... Love his word more than any delectable food out there. His word is our meat, is our manna. This is what we survive off of in the spirit. And I'm going to be honest with you, I think it's books like Jubilees, Jasher, Two Ezras, Enoch, Second Baruch, all the Apocrypha, a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls, not all of them. I've read some of those books and was like, oh, what is not from Yahuwah? 
because you know that 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 group there at the Kruman, they they had leaven, they had Pharisaical leaven doctrines. You know, they weren't perfect, but a lot of their stuff they were they were in charge of keeping preserving those scrolls for us. This is the hidden manna, brothers and sisters. I really believe that these books are the hidden manna that we're giving to eat right now. What's this white stone? It is interesting that you know. It, one of the one of the Jewish tradi- this is a Jewish tradition so just take it for what it is uh, thanks brother Ray Perkins for sharing this with me um, but apparently uh, they put uh, it's an old tradition to place uh, white stones uh, on a grave or I don't know if it's necessarily white but just a stone put stone smooth stones around a grave instead of flowers because you know flowers fade away and they die but the stones never fade away also, the uh, think about the when Joshua crossed the river with the Israelites, he put the the twelve stones up for the twelve tribes. You know this uh, the stone ha- this the stone has a lot of meaning. We know that they were built up stone altars. You know without being touched by any human hands. We know that we're living stones, right? Um, so when it says, "I will give him a white stone," and in the stone a new name written. I mean, think about this for a second. We are literal stones in New Jerusalem. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so, ye be, if so you have tasted that Yahuwah is gracious. Amen to that. Yes, he is. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of Elohim and precious, ye also as lively stones, so right, living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priest priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim by Yahusha HaMashiach. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness to his Torahlessness and to Torah of Messiah is our final sacrifice for sin. So we'll keep what we can. So we'll say, oh, you're picking, choosing what you can pick. Well, is it better? Isn't that better than just throwing it all away? <laughs> which in time past were not a people, but now are a people of Elohim, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I mean, Isaiah forty nine sixteen through eighteen. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands; thy walls are continually before me. He's talking to New Jerusalem, but remember, we are literally building blocks. He's like, he's like, lift up your eyes round about. He's like, look around, look around, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. This is us. As I live, saith Yahuwah, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, and with an, with an ornament, as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. So, like literally, like like ornaments, like building blocks of New Jerusalem, like we come together, right? Go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim, and of the name of the city of my Elohim, which is renewed Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my Elohim, and I will write upon him my new name. Amen. Amen. So that is. Um, which uh, is represented typically of a white stone and a black stone. Urim and Tumim. Why is it not working? Is my internet down? Oh, no.
I'm, I'm back on it, I think. Huh? Okay. Um, are you guys here? says I'm still unable to connect to chat. Why is it not updating this chat? Can you all hear me? Sorry about that. I lost internet completely. It just went down. But I guess we're back up. Alright, here we go. Let's keep going. <sighs> this is what it is. Okay. Looks like I lost a lot of y'all. I'm sure y'all got uh, annoyed. And yeah, I lost about a couple hundred people. No big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Just what happens. So, I don't know where you lost me, but uh, when I was talking about the um, the hidden mana, and then we talked about the white stone, uh, reminds me of the, the Urim and the Thummim. We talked about this last week in the Torah portions. Um, yeah, let me pull it up. The, the Urim and the Thummim is uh, typically known as a, a white stone and a black stone. Um, you know, held in the high priest's hand, and so it just makes me. I'm not saying that this is what it is. It's just it is interesting that um, we've got that white stone in Revelation and, and the white stone in the hand of the priests. We know that we'll be kings and priests, right? So just interesting, interesting. Uh, let's see. And uh, just a couple of scriptures. Basically, the Urim was used, the Urim and the Thummim were used uh, as kind of like uh, how to get an answer from Yahuwah. Right? And he's, uh, Numbers 27 21, and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of the Urim before Yahuwah. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Yahshua with him, even all the congregation. Um, it's also in Deuteronomy 33 8 through 10, talking about the same thing. Uh, 1 Samuel 28 6. Uh, uh, Ezra chapter 2, 62 through 63, just a couple of those verses, but. Uh, I'm just going to make up for some lost time here. We'll keep going. But the Urim, which was believed to be the white stone. Let's take a look at that meaning there. Urim, it's very similar to, you know, uh, or, or uh, the Hebrew word for light. So the biblical usage is lights. And as we know, stones kept in the pouch on the high priest's breastplate used in determining Elohim's decision in certain questions and issues. Uh, Urim, lights, the oracular brilliancy of the figures in the high priest's breastplate, the Urim. Uh, and we also know that we're to be as fiery lights, which is kind of interesting here. Uh, Enoch chapter, is this, 39? And it shall come to pass in those days that the elect and holy children will descend from the high heaven, and their seed will become one with the children of men. And in those days Enoch received books of zeal and wrath, and books of disquiet and expulsion, and mercy shall not be accorded to them, saith Yahuwah Sevaoth. In those days a whirlwind carried me off from the earth, and set me down at the end of the heavens. And there I saw another vision, the dwelling places of the holy the Kodesh, right? And the resting places of the righteous. Here mine eyes saw their dwellings with his righteous angels and their resting places with the Kodesh, the set apart. 
And they petitioned and interceded and prayed for the children of men, and righteousness flowed before them as water, and mercy like dew upon the earth. Thus it is amongst them for ever and ever. And in that place mine eyes saw the elect one of righteousness and of faith, and I saw his dwelling place under the wings of Yahuwah Sebaoth, and righteousness shall prevail in his days, and the righteous and elect shall be without number before him for ever and ever. And all the righteous and the elect before him shall be strong as fiery lights. Amen. And their mouth shall be full of blessing. Amen. Amen. So now let's move on to our final church for the night, uh, Ecclesia, the church of Thyatira. Let's read just a little quick thing about Thyatira. Uh, oops. Man, all these pop ups. <laughs> Sorry. My my. I I tried to I tried to do this to, to take off my ad block, but it didn't work. <laughs> just let me just read it for a second, please. Oh my! <laughs> How embarrassing! There we go. Thyatira. A city of Asia Minor on the borders of Lydia and Myasia. Myasia. Its modern name is Akhisar, i.e. White Castle. Here was one of the seven churches, Revelation 111 and 218-28. Lydia, the seller of purple, or rather of cloth dyed with his color, was from this city, Acts 16-14. It was and still is famous for its dying, like not dying, like like like. like you're dying, but like, you know, dying <laughs> close. Among the ruins, inscriptions have been found relating to the guild of dyers in that city in ancient times. You know what's interesting? I don't actually, I don't think I mentioned this last week, but uh, the seven churches, um, uh, what's the, what is it? Um, what's that uh, star cluster? Um, what's that? Seven, seven stars. Yeah, here we go. The seven churches, right? The seven churches have the same, um, spacing out the same pattern that the seven stars of Ple uh, Pleiades has, which is really interesting, right? It's like almost identical. Uh, seven stars, seven churches. Yeah, so here, like here's a map of it right here. Here's the map of the seven churches, what they look like, and it matches the Pleiades. Pretty interesting. Not a not an accident. You know, and obviously that's just a just to show us that Yahuwah knew the end from the beginning. He knew where the seven ecclesia would be. In the physical, right? And so he made the Pleiades. <laughs> Hallelujah. So remember, Thyatira means sacrifice or sacrifice and offering. All right, Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the called out assembly in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of Elohim, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And we talked about this last week, and I know that Justin and I, we came out with that controversial video today, and um, this is the Greek word, uh, kalkolebanon in the implied mean of whiteness or brilliancy uh, some metal like gold if not more precious and here we go the strongest definition neuter of a compound of these two words in the implied mean of whiteness or brilliancy burnished copper an alloy of copper or gold and silver having a brilliant luster fine brass and last week if you missed it we actually um uh, watched a video that showed us what fine brass looks like in the furnace, and it actually has this like whitening, brilliant effect. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, imagining what John actually saw. So verse nineteen: I know your works and love and service and belief and patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. Wow, that's a lot of excellent qualities, right? So here we go. Once again, a group of people with excellent works. 
works, love, service, belief, which is faith, patience, works again, right? It says works twice. <laughs> That's interesting. And the last to be more than the first, right? These are humble, meek people. They put other people before them. But we're called to be perfect. Are, is any of us going to attain perfection before Messiah comes? I don't know. There have been other people in the scriptures that were perfect. But it, nevertheless, it should be our goal to strive for perfection because uh, Messiah said, be perfect, even as, as my heavenly Father is in heaven is perfect. So he says, you've got all these things. You've got all these great things, notwithstanding, or also like, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you suffered that woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. That's not good. Let's do, uh, let's look at this quick write-up about Jezebel. I hope this lets us look at it. All right, good. So, the, I thought this was a really good uh, synopsis of Jezebel. Let's read about her real quick, those of you that may not know about her. So Jezebel from the Old Testament, Kings, first and second Kings, was the wife of King Ahab, who ruled the kingdom of Israel by opposing the worship of the Hebrew god Yahuwah, neglecting the rights and well-beings of her subjects, and challenging the great prophets Elijah and Elisha, she prompted the internal conflict that plagued Israel for decades. When Jezebel married Ahab, she influenced him to worship Baal, a nature god. As a woman seeking more power, she sought to destroy those who questioned her, and most of the prophets of Yahuwah were murdered at her request. These evil and tyrannical works motiva motivated the righteous vengeance of Elijah, who correctly predicted the encounter uh, of a severe drought as divine retribution against Je Jezebel. Elijah later had the, ba uh, the Baal priests killed after they had failed in a contest with him to see which God would answer their prayers to infl uh, inflame a bull offering, Baal or Yahuwah. When Jezebel learned of the killing, she furiously vowed to have Elijah killed, forcing him to flee for his life. Another cruel act credited to Jezebel is written in 1 Kings 21, 5-16. Next to Ahab's dwelling was a vineyard, which he envied and desired. Right? He, coveted it. he coveted it. It was owned by a civilian, Naboth of Jezreel. When Naboth declined to part with his vineyard as the inheritance of my fathers, is what he said, right? And Jezebel falsely accused him with cursing uh, God and the king, which resulted in Naboth's death by stoning. Elijah faced Ahab in the vineyard and prophesying that he and all his successors would be slain and that dogs would devour Jezebel. Some years after Ahab died uh, in fighting with the Syrians and Jezebel continued on for nearly another 10 years, Elijah's heir, Elisha, the prophet, continued the determination to end Baal worship. He anointed a militant leader named Jehu to be king of Israel, an order that prompted civil war as Jer Jer Jehoram, Jezebel's son, then ruled. Jehu then killed Jehoram and sought to overthrow Jezebel and take his place as ruler of Israel. Anticipating him, she decorated herself in fancy clothing for the occasion. Looking down from her window, she mocked him, and Jehu commanded her eunuchs to toss her out of the window. After her fall and death, he ordered that she be buried as a king's daughter. However, it was found that the dogs had eaten most of her body, just as Elijah had predicted. Jezebel has come to be recognized as a model of the wicked woman, embodying the characteristics of cruelty, greed, and vanity. So, Hopefully that gave you a little either reminder or um, uh, give you an idea of what Jezebel was all about. So again, it says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you suffer that woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And so this can be definitely in uh, the literal, uh, you know, again, with with an, a lawless doctrine, um, you know, it's easy for people to slip into fornication and to, which was big in those days, eating food sacrificed into idols, you know? But also think about this in the, the spiritual sense, in that fornication is mingling with the ways of the nations. Instead of doing the ways and the will of Yahuwah alone, mingling yourself with the ways of the world. 
Jezebel is a metaphor for Mystery Babylon in general, right? We're going to come out of her. We've got to come in, come out of the ways of the world. You know, Sunday, Sunday, the Lord's Day, you know, which was in favor of the, the Shabbat, right? In this day and age, we have feminism and we have men leading, the, women leading the men, even within the body. We have worshiping other Elohim. You know, what about those in mainstream Christianity attempting to worship Yahuwah through the traditions of the world? Their own way, not Yahuwah's way. That's fornication, right? Just like the Pharisees with their man-made traditions. We read about that earlier. What about the big one? Sunday worship we were just talking about. Quotes from the Catholic Church about the Sabbath. The Catholic Record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. Let me zoom in here a little bit here. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Catholic Church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Um, I can leave a link for this, actually, in the chat if anybody want to look this up. Wicked Jezebel. That's right. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day, which by God is Saturday. In keeping the Sunday, they are following the law of the Catholic Church. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Practically everything Protestants regard as essential or important they have received from the Catholic Church. That's true. It's exactly true. The Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in accepting the Bible and observing Sunday in keeping Christmas and Easter, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. It's true. Thus, the observance of Sunday by Protestants is a homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. And the list just goes on. So, this is a big one. I think those that think they're doing the right thing, that are not serving Yahuwah on a Shabbat, Serving other Elohim and serving with someone else's authority and doing it their way, doing it man's way as opposed to Yahuwah's way. That's the fornication I think he's talking about here. Revelation 2.21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. You know, in Jeremiah 3, in the days of old, he gave the children of Israel space to repent of their fornication. Jeremiah 3, They say, If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, Shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, says Yahuwah. So, you know, those that say that, um, you know, he had to die in order to, you know, for, to, for his bride to be able to come back because, you know, the law said that um, he couldn't take back a, a, a woman in fornication. He says right here, You've played for it. You've been in fornication, but he's like, return to me right now. Return to me, and we'll be good. He can do that. Lift up your eyes into the high places and see where you have lin where you have not been lined with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and how thou hast polluted thy land with thy whoredoms, right fornication, and with thy wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withholden, just like in the days of Elijah and Jezebel. And there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. Yahuwah said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, has you, Have you seen that which backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and hath played the harlot, right, serving other Elohim. And I said, After she hath done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous Judah, sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. 
And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith Yahuwah. And Yahuwah said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith Yahuwah, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, says Yahuwah, and I will not keep my anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, and that thou hast transgressed against Yahuwah thy Elohim, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and have not obeyed my voice, saith Yahuwah. The brothers and sisters, this is the repentance. This is the acknowledgement. And if you want a full, detailed, step-by-step way to acknowledge our ways and repent truthfully before Yahuwah, read Daniel 9 and like repeat it verbatim to Yahuwah. That is how we do it. Daniel knew how to do it. Daniel got it done. Daniel 9. Read that when you get some time. Turn, O backsliding children, saith Yahuwah, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and will bring you unto Zion. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith Yahuwah, they shall say no more, The ark of the covenant of Yahuwah, neither shall it come into mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall it be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahuwah, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of Yahuwah, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Amen. I mean, I mean, any case, um, yeah, we can stop there. So maybe that give you a little better idea of what we're talking about here. As far as giving her space to repent for her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that break, break wedlock for, or, you know, fornication with her into great tribulation, which is, you know, break wedlock is adultery into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So here, you know, here he's giving these people, this group of people, an opportunity to repent of their fornication, whether it be physical or spiritual fornication. This church has an opportunity to repent. And he's saying right here, basically he's saying, right, this church is going to be cast into tribu- tribulation except they repent of their deeds. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that this church, if they repent of their deeds, will not go through tribulation, this great tribulation. So once again, those that keep his ways will be spared. Those that don't, won't. That's the foolish and the wise virgins for you. It's summed up. They both believed. They both confessed. But one was obedient, one was not. 2 Ezra 15, 20, 24 through 27. Woe to those who sin, which we know sin is transgression of the Torah. Woe to those who sin and do not observe my commandments, says Yahuwah. I will not spare them. Depart, you faithless children. Do not pollute my sanctuary, for Yahuwah knows all who transgress against him. Therefore, he will hand them over to death and slaughter. For now calamities have come upon the whole earth. This comes one time, the great tribulation. For now calamities have come upon the whole earth, and you shall remain in them, for Elohim will not deliver you because you have sinned against him. What does that tell you for someone who is keeping his commandments and has faith? They will not go through tribulation. To Ezra 16, 74 through 78, promise of the divine deliverance. Here, my elect, says Yahuwah, behold, the days of tribulation are at hand, and I will deliver you from them. From the, He will deliver us from the days of tribulation. Do not fear or doubt, for Elohim is your guide. Who is he talking to? You who keep my commandments and precepts, says Yahuwah. He's not talking to people who disregard his, his commandments and precepts, period. I don't care how nice of a person they are, how sweet they are, how soft-spoken they are. You who keep my commandments and precepts, says Yahuwah, he is not a respecter of persons. Do not let your sins pull you down or your iniquities prevail over you. Listen, if you're, if you're addicted to something, if you're an addict and you can't get off those pills, or you can't get off those drugs, or you can't get off that, uh, that alcohol, or if you can't get the wickedness out of your heart to stop hating people, if you can't stop porn addiction, you, you can't stop your filthy mouth. Whatever it is. I, I, I don't know. I, there's a million things, right? There's a million things that pull us down. Now is the time to stop, brothers and sisters. 
You want to be that person that says, pray you be worthy to escape all these things that comes to pass and to stand before the Son of Man? Do not let your sins pull you down or your iniquities prevail over you. Again, this is the time. This is the time. This is the time to break those. You want to know how to break those? Uh, let's see, fast. Um, is it 58, I think? Yeah, here we go. You're having trouble breaking something? You're having trouble breaking that addiction or the hate in your heart or whatever is plaguing you? Here's your recipe for success right here. Isaiah 58, 6 through 11. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? Right? Isn't sin our heavy burden? And to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? What is this yoke? What yoke do you have around you? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry that thou bring to the poor that are cast out of thy house? Asked out... They are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that to cover him and thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health sp shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go forth before thee. The glory of Yahuwah shall be thy reward. Right? In any case, but the, the key here was right here, verse 6, Isaiah 58, 6. Fast. If you need to break something, fast. Do some Fast. Fast from something. Fast from the internet. Fast from TV. You should be fasting from TV anyways. Fast from food. If you cannot break these, these heavy yokes, if you've got something plaguing you, and you just, you've got that, that, that sin that you just can't get rid of, fast. Beg him to take it out of your heart. Beg him during a fast to hear your prayer on high that no power or principality hinder your prayer. Don't tell anybody about it. Fast just between you and Yahuwah alone. Maybe if you have a significant other, may they may need to know you're fasting, right? But don't go boasting to your friends or colleagues or coworkers, oh, I'm fasting. Ah, oh, mm, so hungry. Do it alone between you and Yahuwah alone and fast and break the, the, the heavy yoke, the heavy burden, the bands of wickedness. That's how you do it. Do not let your sins pull you down or your iniquities prevail over you. Woe to those who are choked by their sins or overwhelmed by their iniquities as a field is choked with underbrush and its path overwhelmed with thorns so that no one can pass through. It is shut off and be given up and given up to be consumed by fire. I don't think you want to be consumed by fire, brothers and sisters. Uh, 223, and I will kill her children with death and all the called out assembly shall know that I am he which searches the minds and the hearts and I will give unto everyone according to your works. It's plain and simple. Don't let anybody give you any vain, vain teaching, right? I, Yahuwah, search the heart. I try the reins and give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Psalm sixty two twelve also unto thee, O Yahuwah, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Matthew sixteen twenty seven for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Amen. Amen, amen. Revelation twenty thirteen and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. That needs no interpretation from me. <laughs> That's plain and simple. But unto you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I would put on you no other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. Amen. You know, the depths of Satan back then, in those days, Gnosticism was rampant. Salvation by knowledge. And listen... There's, there's some of that still going on today, right? We're saved by faith in Messiah Yahusha alone. And what is Messiah Yahusha? He is the law, the prophets, the writings, all of it. What does it mean to believe? It says the, the, the law says, the Torah says that not the hearers but the doers shall be justified. Listen, you know, and, and about this, these depths of Satan, 
uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, you know, there's some, there's some big Torah ministries out there that all they do is focus about researching and speaking about evil, right? I know we have all different callings, trust me. I'm staying in my lane here. I'm not trying to get out of my lane, right? I know we all have different callings from Yahuwah, but seriously, what's our focus? Feeding ourselves and others on the word or constantly feeding and researching, uh, feeding by researching the enemy, right? Are we always just looking, is it all we do is consume ourselves with conspiracy theories and um, learning about all the wicked ways of pagan practices and witch, learning more about witchcraft and how evil it is. And, you know, I mean, learning all these things. I, there's some ministries out there that's all they focus on. And I know it's important to understand that the evil exists, but there's got to be a point that we realize that Satan's got a hold of this, of this world, right? What should we be feeding on? Should we be... Should we be focusing on the depths of Satan as they speak, right? Or should we be just focusing on the word? Just something to think about. Something to think about for you all. Who do you li- what do you listen to all the time, right? Are you listening to the depths of Satan all the time? Do you really need to know about every single conspiracy out there out there? Listen, some of them are very important and I'm I'm not your daddy, you know, I'm not here to tell you what to watch and what not to watch, but just think about, you know, what your what the focuses of your studies are. And how are you being fed? I'm, so, I'm like, I ain't your daddy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I lose my bearings sometimes. Sorry. So, I will put upon you no other burden, he says. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30. Let's talk about yoke. Let's talk about burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rests unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the no other burden. He's talking about his yoke, his burden. Let's talk about more what that is. First of all, let's establish, reestablish that John 1 1 says, the beginning, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Amen. Messiah is the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of one, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of the Torah. Because he is the Torah. First John 5, 3. For this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're not heavy. They're not hard. People that are caught up in the world, it might be hard because they don't want to give up their Saturday. Because they want to continue buying and selling. They want to go out to eat on Saturday. They want to do whatever. They, want to, you know, whatever. First John two three through six. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth the Torah is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of Elohim perfected. And hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. First James, uh, first James, James one twenty five. But whoso looketh into the perfect Torah of liberty, right of freedom, the Torah of freedom, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So it says, it, James says, this is the Torah of freedom. Psalm 119, 44 through 45, So shall I keep thy Torah continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, at freedom, for I seek thy precepts. Psalm 19, 7 through 11, The Torah of Yahuwah is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahuwah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahuwah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahuwah is pure, enlighten the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yah are pure and righteous altogether. Right? More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Straight out of the heart of David, a man after Yahweh's own heart. Amen. So, yes. What's our conclusion? Messiah Yahusha is the law, the prophets, the writings. And when we walk in his Torah, it's freedom. When we walk contrary to his Torah, it's bondage. Period. Just another another uh, witness here. To Baruch 
41. Oops, let me log out here. This, sorry. Let's try that again. Second Baruch 41. And I answered and said, For whom and for how many shall these things be, or who will be worthy to live at that time? For I will speak before you everything that I think, and I will ask of you regarding those things which I meditate. For lo, I see many of your people who have withdrawn from your covenant and have cast from them the yoke of the Torah. This is the Torah. This is the yoke. This is the burden that Messiah was talking about here. when He says, I will put upon you no other burden other than the Torah. You don't have to listen to these man-made doctrines and these pharisaical evil rules that are heavy upon people. Right? The yoke of the Torah. That's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> but that which you have sorry <clears throat> but that which you have already hold fast till I come and he that overcomes and guards my works unto the end guards his Torah guards his commandments until the end to him will I give power over the nations that is an awesome promise and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father and I will give him the morning star he that has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach says unto the called out assemblies. Now that's an awesome promise, eh? Now I'm Canadian, right? Psalm 2. This is the same promise that is given to Yahusha by Yahuwah. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahuwah and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Yahuwah shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. This is where he's speaking, right? Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree Yahuwah hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I mean, this is the same promise that we're given for those that overcome. And remember, I believe that the rewards for each church, each ecclesia, is collective. I believe that's for everybody. All seven of those are rewards for the all of the uh, the everyone that overcomes, that are victorious. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, this is the kings of the earth, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve Yahuwah with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen. So, again, this promise, right, the promise for Yahusha is the same for us. Why? Because for Romans 8.29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Right? That's an interesting passage. He also calls us brethren in another passage. First John 3, 2 through 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of Elohim, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. And every man that hath his hope in himself or in him purify himself even as he is pure. Revelation twenty verse six Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of Mashiach, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. Amen, amen. So Last but not least here, and this is how we're going to finish up with this. This is going to be a special treat for you guys. I uh, I hope you all are ready for this one. For those of you that are on Patreon with me, you uh, got to see this a few weeks ago. Those of you that are on Patreon, you got to see this a few weeks ago. So what I'm, what I'm doing with Patreon is I never want to give a teaching just for those who support the ministry. I think the teach all the teachings should be free to everybody no matter what. But what I am doing is just giving Patreon subscribers like a, a couple weeks um, preview of these. And that cuz that way I, I like uh, I like feedback. I like uh, I, I this is actually good for me too because um, people have given me more info input to put into the studies. So you can like literally be part of these studies. Um, 
and uh, I, you know people can shoot holes in it and be like, no, I, I'm, I'm going to shoot some Swiss cheese, put some Swiss cheese in your study here, Adam. And I, good, I like it. I like sharpening. Um, but um, this is a study that really touched me, um, unlike a lot of, uh, in, a, in a way that I'm, so, I'm, I'm stuttering because there's just so much I want to say about this study. This study is something that has blessed me greatly, and I pray that it blesses you. And what it's sur- surrounding is, and I will give him the morning star. This is just a small piece to this large study. This study stemmed from Enoch chapter 43 that we read live um, a couple weeks ago. And we read through chapter 43 of Enoch. And, you know, I've read that chapter, I don't know, I boast how many times. I'm just going to say I read it a lot, okay? I never saw it. And as I read it live, it was like, all of a sudden, like, I had never seen this verse before. What did this verse just say? Are you kidding me? And it set me on a whirlwind, and I and I prayed to Yahuwah for guidance and come up with a, a study here. So, you know, I thought I was going to put a really intricate, um, handsome-looking video to this, but just time is so short that I think I'm, uh, I'm going to read it for you guys. I'm going to read the study for you here. Um, but I'm just going to make a cutout of this and make a separate video for just this teaching. And uh, so let's go. Let's talk about uh, what this means and what Enoch 43 means. So let's talk about it. Oh. There we go. So it's called Identity of the Stars in Enoch 43. And here's just the uh, little uh, thumb I made for it. What are these? They are the names of the righteous who dwell upon the earth who believe in the name of Yahweh Sevaoth forever and ever, Enoch one forty three. It's the identity of the stars in heaven. So, this is the title of it: the identity of the stars in heaven revealed in Enoch forty three. While the secular world has their own teaching as to what the heavenly luminaries are, many of us are being woken up and quickly learning the word of Yahuwah is our authority and has something substantially different to reveal to us. Even in the mainstream apostate church system, some would even venture to say they are the angels, the stars, right? But is that where the story ends? We recently read the book of First Enoch publicly during a weekly gathering, and when we came across chapter 43, I was stunned. Did the Most High just reveal the identity of the stars in heaven through the prophet Enoch? How did I miss this before? It's time to take a Berean approach to this and let the Word and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, do the teaching and reveal the truth that has been hidden so long. Let's start at the beginning when Yahuwah spoke to Avraham saying, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall they seed be, right? So he told Abraham to look up at the stars, so shall your seed be, just like that. And he believed in Yahuwah, and he counted it to him for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6, 5 through 6. This is just an allegory from Yahuwah to Avraham, giving him a visual of the vastness of his eventual offspring, right? So this is, this is just allegory, right? Maybe there's more to this story. Let's investigate by starting with First Enoch 43. And I saw other lightnings and the stars of heaven, and I saw how he called them all by their names, and they hearkened unto him. And I saw how they are weighed in a righteous balance according to the proportions of light. I saw the width of their spaces and the day of their appearing, and how their revolution produces lightning. And I saw their revolution according to the number of the angels, and how they keep faith with each other. And I asked the angel who was who went with me, I'm sorry, I asked the angel who went with me, who showed me what was hidden, what are these? Sorry, this is Enoch asking the angel, what are these? He's looking at the stars. He's like, what are these? And he said to me, Yahuwah Sebaoth has showed you their similitude. These are the names of the Kodesh, the holy, who dwell on the earth and believe the name of Yahuwah Sebaoth forever and ever. Enoch 43. I can't even imagine how many times I've read this chapter and never saw this. How amazing is it that Yahuwah opens our eyes in his perfect timing? It seems clear in this text that those that believe in his name and hearken to his voice are either the stars or a reflection of them, a parabolic symbolic meaning. Maybe it's even both, right? Let's break down and discuss a few key portions of this text. We'll start at verse 1. And I saw other lightnings and the stars of heaven, and I saw how he all called them by their names, and they hearkened unto him. The first attribute of the heavenly luminaries are that they hearkened unto him. What does it mean to hearken unto him? 
For this, I'd like to share two portions of scriptures to stand as witnesses. If you, will, if you diligently hearken to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim and do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. Exodus 15, 26, right? So that's, that's example one. Example two, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim has driven you, and shall return unto Yahweh your Elohim, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command you this day. Right here, this is what it means to obey his voice, to hearken to his voice. You and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that then Yahweh your Elohim will turn your captivity and have compassion on you and will turn and gather you from all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim has scattered you. Deuteronomy 31-3 through With these two examples, we can clearly see that hearkening to the voice of Yahuwah is by keeping his ways, Torah, his instructions for living, commandments, judgments, statutes, precepts. On a quick side note, what an amazing passage in Deuteronomy 31 through 3, as this is the promise for the end times remnant when we see a group of people coming back to his ways after almost 1,800 years of apostasy. This is the marker in time for when he is about to regather his people, known as the fig tree generation. For more on this, please study and compare with the fig tree parable given by Yahusha in Matthew 24, 32 through 35, Mark 13, 28 through 29. And Luke 21, 29-31. Next verse in Enoch 43. And I saw how they are weighed in a righteous balance according to their proportions of light. Enoch 43, 2. Let's compare this verse with some other things Messiah himself revealed. Right? So we're talking about proportions of light. Their uh, righteous balance, proportion of light. Then Yahusha, Yahusha again... Uh, um, then spoke Yahusha again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have shall have the light of life. While we are here, let it be known that the scriptures need to interpret the scriptures. That's Yahuwah's way. Let us establish a few things. So we're talking about the light of life here, right? Torah is light, Proverbs 6.23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. Torah is life. Proverbs thirteen fourteen. The Torah of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Also, regarding Torah is life. Deuteronomy thirty two forty six through forty seven. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this Torah, for it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. So getting back on track, keeping in mind Yahusha is the light, I, Yahusha, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the ecclesia, the church. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. This is what we saw right here, and I will give him the morning star. <clears throat> Revelation twenty-two sixteen. Many understand the bright and morning star to be the wandering star or what secular science calls planets that many know as this name uh, this right this planet but it's not we know it's not really this this is just nasa whatever but this is what i was talking about here it's no this planet is known as the bright and morning star it's this it's the brightest star right <clears throat> I won't speak this name as we are commanded not to make mention of pagan god names according to Exodus 23.13. Regardless, Yahusha plainly states he as that star, which happens to be the brightest one Yahuwah created. Hallelujah. Let's take this a step further. Beloved, now are we the sons of Elohim, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Just like him, that's a hard concept to wrap our minds around, but the scriptures say what they say. One more example on this thought, and we actually read this one earlier as well. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8.29 The scriptures are clear that Yahusha is the light, and that we will be like him, and that we can be considered his brethren, also found in Matthew 12.50. So where does that put us? <clears throat> Sorry, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on, on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew five fourteen through sixteen. And and no doubt this is talking about our good deeds, our workings of the Torah, so that others can see it and be drawn unto the Father. So we are the light. Well, that is what Messiah Yahusha said. Let's continue as he gives us promise for those that overcome the world. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive my Father, and I will give him the morning star. So this is part of our study tonight, Revelation 2, uh, 26-28. Very, inter- very interesting indeed, wouldn't you say? So, <clears throat> as you can see here, I kind of wrote this as a script, and I'm kind of just reading you off my script here, so it is what it is. <laughs> Next portion of Enoch 43. I saw the width of their spaces and the day of their appearing and how their revolution produces lightning. And I saw their revolution according to the number of the angels and how they keep faith with each other. This is the R.H. Charles version. It says right here, I use the R.H. Charles version above. Let's take a look at the Sefer translation and compare. The amplitude, which means, this is my writing right here, which means greatness, of their places and the day of their appearance and their conversion. That's interesting, right? Splendor produced splendor and their conversion was into the number of the angels and of the faithful. So certainly he's describing their order where it's written the day of their appearance and their conversion. Could this be literally talking about his offspring as to the day of their appearance coming into the world, right? And conversion to him? Considering he knew the end from the beginning, I'd say it's highly possible. I'd also like to point out another interesting scripture from Enoch chapter 39. And it shall come to pass in those days that the elect and holy children will descend from the high heaven and their seed will become with the children become one with the children of men. Enoch 39:1. I don't know exactly what this means, but I will say this. It seems to be common knowledge that the stars are angels in heaven. So what is Enoch saying here? It's hard to draw an exact conclusion, but it seems the angels and the righteous men will become one, or possibly in the sense of dwelling together, right? So last portion of Enoch 43. And I asked the angel who went with me and who showed me what was hidden, what are these? Again, he's talking, look at the stars. And he said unto me, Yahuwah Sevaoth has showed you their similitude. These are the names of the Kodesh, the holy, who dwell on the earth, that's us, and believe in the name of Yahuwah Sevaoth forever and ever. Isn't that us, brothers and sisters? Don't we believe in the name of Yahuwah Sevaoth forever and ever? So there it is again, those that believe in his name. Hallelujah, Yahuwah. But let's back up a bit. Yahuwah Sevaoth has showed you their similitude. Let's look at the word similitude. Definition of similitude, Merriam-Webster. Counterpart, double, a visible likeness. Image, and this is my words here. Remember, we are conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8.29. An imaginative comparison, simile, correspondence in kind or quality, a point of comparison. So what I really see here is a counterpart, a double. Like, is that a uh, a double for us? You know, it's in the book. It's in a very highly uh, controversial book. The uh, It's uh, the um, the vision of Paul. In the vision of Paul, it plainly states that Yahuwah created an angel for each and every one of us, and they literally follow us around every day and report back to Yahuwah every day what we do all day long. So are the stars our angel counterpart? Is that a reflection of us? Hopefully this is starting to make sense to you, but let's look at a few last references and wrap up this study as I cannot wait for nighttime tonight and take a look at the stars with a new re- renewed understanding. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 3, right? Hallelujah. While we are in Daniel 12, there are two other verses that I'd like to add in for good measure. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12, 4, we are here, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Yahuwah has been increasing wisdom. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. And we should, we should, we should meditate on this verse because we don't. Sometimes we just don't get why there's a brick wall and people don't understand what we're trying to tell them. But the wise shall understand. Daniel twelve ten. 
Praise be to Yahuwah for allowing us to understand and to hearken to his voice, thus making us wise in his eyes, believing in and following his word, Yahusha. As he was identified all throughout the scriptures, but plainly for us in John 1, 1 and 14. I hear like, look, this is my, sorry, this is like my, um, uh, my man- transcript. Let's take a So, and we read this earlier, John 1, 1 and 14, right? We know that uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was uh, with Elohim, and the word was Elohim, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, let's take a look at one of the most intriguing pieces of evidence. We will be reading from the book of Second Baruch. Baruch was the scribe of Jeremiah, but was also a prophet in his own right. His first book was included in the 1611 KJV, the Septuagint, and others. This is kind of a long read. Give me a sec. All right. Uh, Second Baruch. uh, This is actually chapter 51. And it shall come to pass, when that appointed day has gone by, that then shall the aspect of those who are condemned be afterward changed, and the glory of those who are justified. For the aspect of those who now act wickedly shall become worse than it is, as they shall suffer torment. Also, as for the glory of those who have now been justified in my Torah, yes, right, he went there, and this is my own word right here, right? Remember, Yahusha is the Torah made flesh, who have had understanding in their life and who have planted in their heart the root of wisdom, then their splendor shall be glorified in changes, and the form of their faces shall be turned into the light of their beauty, that they may be able to acquire and receive the world which, is, which does not die, which is then promised to them. For over this... Above all, shall those who come then lament that they rejected my Torah and stop their ears that they might hear wisdom and receive understanding. Oh, my heart goes out to a lot of people, and yours should too, that are rejecting his Torah. When therefore they see those over whom they are now exalted, but who shall then be exalted and glorified more than they, they shall respectively be transformed the latter into the splendor of angels. There it is again. And the former shall yet more waste away. So the wicked, the evil shall waste away. And those that were justified in belief in Messiah, his Torah, and kept his Torah, the latter is the splendor of the angels, right? Uh so yet, uh, I say, I'm sorry. So, the latter into the splendor of angels, and the former shall yet waste more waste away in the wonder at the visions and the beholding of the forms, for they shall first behold and afterwards depart to be tormented. But those who have been saved by their works, and this is my words now. Remember, faith without works is dead. And to whom the Torah has been now a hope and understanding and expectation and a wisdom. In wisdom, a confidence shall wonders appear their time. For they shall behold the world which is now invisible to them, and they shall behold the time which is now hidden from them. And time shall no longer age them, for in the heights of that world shall they dwell, and they shall be made like unto the angels, and be made equal to the stars. Right? And they shall be changed into every form they desire, from beauty into loveliness, and from light into the splendor of glory. Right? Wow. For there shall be spread before them the extensive paradise, and there shall be shown to them the beauty of the majesty of the living creatures which are beneath the throne, and all the armies of the angels who are now held fast by my word, lest they should appear, and are held fast by command, that they may stand in their places till their advent comes. Moreover, there shall then be the excellency of the righteous surpassing that in the angels. Second Baruch 51, 1-12. So, What an amazing passage, which states that those that believe and obey, which we have already established, obedience be to be hearkening to the voice of Yahuwah, will be made equal to the stars and surpassing that in the angels. Hallelujah. Now, for our last portion of scriptures to consider, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul was given some wisdom on the matter as well. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of Yahuwah. I speak this to your shame. But Simon will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Don't be foolish. That which you sow is not quickened, except it die. And that which you sow, you sow not that the body shall be, but bore grain. It may chance of wheat or some of other grain, but Yah gives it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. 
All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds. And this is 1 Corinthians 15, 34 through 39. Continuing, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So he's likening this, right? For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. What's Paul saying here? It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening ruach, spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 45. <clears throat> how be it, that, how be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is Elohim from heaven, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have, now here's, where, here's the kicker, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, so shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Up there. So, brothers and sisters, are we the stars? Or are the stars a reflection of the righteous ones of Yahuwah? It remains to be seen. And with all things, it is up to you to test and to take to prayer of Yahuwah, who you should be taking all matters to. We're going to finish the study with a few last verses that a dear sister shared with me regarding this research. This is what I was telling you guys about Patreon. But before that, I want to encourage you to continue to run the race that is set before us with endurance, brothers and sisters, keeping faith in Messiah Yahusha and hearkening unto the voice of Yahuwah like it hasn't been done in almost 2,000 years. For after all, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther 4.14 We all have a role to play in these end times. Have you asked Yahuwah to reveal yours? Yahuwah bless you and keep you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, now in Hebrew. Yevarecha Yahuwah veyesh merecha Ya'er Yahuwah panav elecha vechnuneka yesa Yahuwah panav elecha veyeshem lecha shalom. All right, here are those verses I want to share with you. I swear to you, righteous, that in heaven the angels record your goodness before the glory of El Elohim. Wait with patient hope, for formerly you have been disgraced with evil and with affliction, but now you shall shine like the luminaries of heaven. You shall be seen, and the gates of heaven shall be opened to you. Hanok, Enoch 104, 1 through 2. You shall not fear those who trouble you, for restoration shall be yours. A splendid light shall shine around you, and the voice of tranquility shall be heard from heaven. Hanok, Enoch, 96.4. Last one. And now will I call the spirits of the good from the generation of light, and will change those who have been born in darkness, who have not in their bodies been recompensed with glory, as their belief may have merited. I will bring them into the splendid light of those who love my holy name. And I will place each of them on a throne of glory, of glory his own, and they shall be at rest during unnumbered periods. Righteous is the judgment of Elohim. Hanok, Enoch, 105, 25-26. Amen, brothers and sisters. I pray that that was a blessing for you. And like I said, I am going to cut this out from here. And make a, a separate video of this with you know with some nice visuals and whatnot to put behind it. But I uh, I pray that was a blessing to you. And that is going to conclude our uh, live stream tonight, our our study. And uh, I pray that maybe you learned something new. Uh, nevertheless, I pray that it was a blessing to you, whether you learned something new or not, or maybe just confirmed some things that you already knew. A uh, couple of uh, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, I want you all to pr I want you guys to pray for Faisal. Um, this is our brother in Pakistan. 
Um, we were able to fund his building up to a certain point, but uh, progress has stopped. So uh, if any of you feel led to continue to assist Faisal, um, I don't have his information here right now, but I will. you can check back later. I'll have it in the description box, and I'll pin it as a comment. Uh, I'll give you his uh, bank information for anybody that may want to uh, send him some money to continue that building effort. Excuse me. As we, uh, as those of you that uh, started with me from the beginning, I uh, encouraged you to prepare. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? It's, it looks like they're shutting down the country and the economy on purpose. And I would love for you to make sure you have enough food and water for your family, because we don't know. Um, you know, Noah's warned, and he had to build an ark. We've been warned that these days are coming. Famine, pestilence. I would get some food and water for you, brothers and sisters. Most importantly, we need to prep spiritually. We need to be right with Yahuwah. We need to uh, believe in Him, call upon His name, and keep His commandments. That's number one. But secondary to that, I really would like you all to get some food and water. Don't do it tomorrow because it's Shabbat. You can wait for Sunday. The um, tour portions next. Give me about 10 minutes and we'll get started. Week 21. Big focus on the Shabbat tonight. And some other interesting stuff we'll talk about. But um, uh, I'm just going to hang out with the chat for maybe about five minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll end this tonight. So who's in here tonight? I see Sister, Sister Camilla. Good to see you. Welcome. I call I call Sister Camilla Miriam. Anonymous, Enoch 104. Yes, I did re read Enoch 104. Um, Joe Mova, good to see you. Tatiana Asmo Asmakova, Singing Bird, good to see you. Joe Mova, uh, uh, Nick Knack Naturally, Yah bless you and keep you all. Shalom, thank you. Christian D, Shields Up, brothers and sisters. Hey, I agree. Robin Peterson, Good to see you. Sherry Stadel. Good to see you, sister. Celio. Celio Ramos. Good to see you, bro. Welcome. Sister Wayfeather. Welcome back. Omega Truth. Austin, New York. Hey, what's going on, brother? Sister Karen Marie Russell. Thank you uh, again all to all the moderators for being leaders in the chat. Thank you for helping me. Josh Patzik. Yeah, spiritual preparation is much more important than the physical. But I understand, brother. Yeah, I mean, listen, that's first and foremost. But we can't be ignorant. We can't see this danger and just be like, eh, I'll be fine. No big deal. I would get a copy of the Sefer or physical copies of, you know, some of these removed books like Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch. Just ha If it's not the Sefer, get them somewhere else. Arthur Herring, hey, good to see you, bro. Best hair in the Nazarene chat. <laughs> Deborah Fagan. Nicole Sather. Deborah Fagan says she's trying. Keep it going, sister. Sister Sherry State will put her link up there. Anybody who wants some zit zit. Oh, where are my examples? I just cleaned the garage and I just packed them somewhere, didn't I? Hold on. Uh, well. So, brothers and sisters, also, listen... Passover is coming up soon. I'm also going to do a quick how-to for Passover. I know we're all in different calendars. Um, I'm celebrating it the evening of April 8th um, and then doing the seven days of unleavened bread. And again, we are going to... Um, I don't have the exact date of the full Torah reading. We're going to be reading the entire Torah. Myself, uh, Jeremy Fox, who's probably in the chat tonight, and Ju uh, Brother Justin McRoberts, the three of us, uh, are going to read the Torah straight up from you know f like 4 or 5 in the morning Central Standard Time all the way well into the evening. We're going to read first beginning of Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy. So um, when I get a date, I'm going to give you a heads up, but I'd love for you all to be with us for the entire thing. Um, what a blessing it would be to go through the entire Torah. It's going to be rigorous, right? But we can do it. We can do it. Jack Hill, brother, hey, it's Yahuwah that opens eyes. Um... 
give him all esteem, all glory. If if I've got any wisdom, it's only because he gave it. Yeah. Clay Blackmore says peanut butter is a good prepping food. I agree. Listen, I got uh, some peanut butter. I got some rice, uh, some beans, some lentils, some t canned tuna. Um, extra dog food and cat food. Got to care about them too. Anyways, toilet paper, baby wipes, water, home protection. Listen, it might sound fleshly, but I really believe we are, are called to do this, are called to uh, prepare. I really do. But uh, anyways, I, I meant to, I, I got off track. I'm going to be doing a, a how-to video for Passover. Um, if you've got a, a different calendar, hey, awesome. Uh, if you want to celebrate the same night, a lot of us are celebrating with the full moon on, Pat, on, on April 8th. Uh, by all means, and we'll be doing a how-to so that you and your family know what to do. And this year, I'm not going to do any traditions of men. I'm just going to do what the scriptures say. Um, and I'm going to have my shoes on my feet and my loins girded about, and I'm going to have my staff in my hand. Yes, I've got a good walking staff. I'm going to have it in my hand. And I'm going to recite the, uh, the, the Passover story to my family. Um, I am going to drink some wine. It's, it's in Jubilees that, uh, you know, in wine and... and um, Gonna eat my lamb, brother Adam, uh, Akira Adam, uh, Adamu, who's in the chat here. He's gonna be joining me, but um, it's gonna be a good night. La a couple years ago, we just got water in a bowl. Uh, we'll, we'll talk. About, we'll talk about how to, the how to when I do that video. But listen, brothers and sisters, the Passover is so important in in um, Exodus. It says that it's his mark, right? It's a mark on your forehead and in your in your hand to keep his Passover that the Torah may be in your mouth. So, anyways, we're going to part with uh, pr a little prayer and then the uh, Song of Moshe by Brother Alan, and uh, we're going to end tonight. So, let's bow our heart. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, Most High, we just come before you and just, again, thank you for the ability to gather like this. Um, and to learn your your word together. We thank you first and foremost for Messiah Yahusha, uh, your word, our King of Kings, and just pray that you continue to cultivate our heart to bring forth uh, the fruit that you desire um, and that we walk according to the, the calling. Abba, we just pray that you guide us and protect us. You know, if there is a virus going around, protect us from it. If it's 5G, protect us from it. Whatever it is, if it's just nonsense, protect us from it, Abba, because we know that you are a healer, you are our shield, you are our buckler, and that no matter, no amount of prepping we do is going to matter because you are our protector, you are our shield, Abba. So guide us, guide us and protect us from what is coming, Abba, and we are just truly waiting on you. We're waiting for Messiah Yahushua to return and to gather us. You are our hope. We bless you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. So, Song of Moshe, I pray it blesses you. And uh, I pray that tomorrow, uh, during the day, Shabbat is a uh, blessing to you and your family. And again, for those of you that have not been able to celebrate it yet, I pray that uh, Yahuwah makes a way. Shabbat Shalom. Love you. Highly exalted, the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yeah. I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him. Elohim of my Father And I exalt Him 
Yahuwah is a man of battle Yahuwah is his name He has cast Pharaoh's chariots And his army into the sea And his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds The depths covered them they went down to the bottom like a stone Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah Has become great in power Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah Has crushed the enemy And in the greatness of your excellence you pulled down those who rose up against you You sent forth your wrath It consumed them like stubble And with the wind of your nostrils The waters were heaped up The floods stood like a wall The depths became stiff In the heart of the sea The enemy said I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil My being is satisfied on them I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them You blew with your wind, the sea covered them They sank like lead in the mighty waters Who is like you? Yahuwah, among the mighty ones Who is like you, great in Kodeshah Awesome in praises, working wonders You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them In your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed in your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan. Melted Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm They are as silent as a stone Until your people pass over Oh, Yahuwah Until the people whom you have bought pass over you bring them in and plant them In the mountain of your inheritance In the place, O oh, Yahuwah Which you have made for your own dwelling The meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah Which your hands have prepared Yahuwah reigns forever Never Thank you.